Now that we've briefly looked at how we might define K-12 online learning or the different ways of defining K-12 online learning and, and how those are used and in some cases misused, let's turn our attention a little bit to how we can go about describing different types of K-12 online learning. If you look at the asynchronous material that's been prepared, one of the first ways in which we can see that it is presented to us is a model that Tom Clark came up with back in 2000, 2001. And you'll note here that basically the way in, the categories that are used are all focused upon essentially who is providing the online learning uh, that is occurring. And in some cases, um, the geographic reach of that online learning when you consider things like state-based or regional-based. Um, but in most cases it was actually looking specifically at the the authorizer or the organization that was actually the one delivering the online learning. Now over the years this has been refined a number of times mostly by John Watson and his team at Evergreen um, uh, consulting as part of their annual keeping pace with K-12 online learning reports. And this is the, the, the sort of the latest version that they've got here now in terms of models, um, at least the latest way in which they've presented it. And you'll notice that um, while it still uses the who is delivering it, um, you can see now that it's starting to get a little bit more uh, specific. So you're looking at you know where the funding is coming from, whether or not the online learning is supplemental or full-time, the geographic reach, which was only a small part of the first group, and really the, the type of governance that's involved. And by that I mean, you know, is it a, a single district? Is it a consortium that's running it? Is it a university or college that's running it? But even this, in all honesty, is limiting in some respects. And you'll see that as we get later in the presentation. Um, you know, so this this is a much more developed uh, version uh, than the one that Clark originally proposed, a much more detailed version, uh, but still quite limited in some respects. And, and you'll see that in, in a second as we go through some of the specific examples. Um, we looked at this image, this, this model, um, in the last presentation, um, but taking a quick look at it again, I mean, this is sort of the supplemental model where you've got students that are enrolled in brick and mortar schools, and, and this is actually one good way of describing um, online learning, uh, K-12 online learning, is to look at sort of, you know, where the student is located, where the teacher is located, is it full-time or part-time, obviously this being a, a part-time situation where the students are in the schools, or a supplemental situation where the students are in the schools being supported, in this case the teacher is resident in one of those schools, which doesn't always happen. Um, if you contrast that, say, with a, a full-time or a cyber schooling model, you know, you've got the school, which could be a single physical building, where you've got, you know, an administrator and tech support and a bunch of online teachers, um, or they could be spread out over many different areas. Uh, you'll find that some cyber schools or full-time programs, um, everyone comes to a single building to actually work. In other cases, they're spread out. And the students are resident in their own homes. Um, and it's they're accompanied by a learning coach, which is often a, a parent or guardian, although it doesn't have to be. Um, and in this instructional model, it's actually the learning coach that's responsible for providing much of the instruction, and obviously for that in loco parenthesis role. Um, the online teeter, teacher in many of these uh, situations basically act as an on-demand tutor and, and a grader because the asynchronous course content that's been uh, created does a lot of the actual teaching and a lot of the grading when you look at the standardized tests that are built in. And the learning coach tends to be that first um, initial tutoring step. When we look at how this kind of operationalizes, I want to provide a couple of examples. Um, E-Learning Ontario, which is a program run by the Ministry of Education in the Canadian province of Ontario, would be a good example of a province-wide or statewide um, body, but it doesn't fit nicely into the model. You see, eLearner in Ontario provides a provincial learning management system that any high school can use, that any online program in the province can use. It provides content through its uh, resource bank that would populate those learning management systems for all of the courses that it, it offers. So a school could use this for blended learning purposes or they could use it as part of an online program. Um, they also provide a, a, a series of administrative support from regional coordinators 
to district personnel to um, actual policies that the boards who are using these programs have to participate in but they don't actually offer distance education the school boards that participate in the program are the ones that actually hire the teachers that manage the individual programs so while this is a province-wide or statewide program that you've got here um, it's missing some of the pieces so you've got the districts that are essentially tapping into this and creating district-based programs so when you try to describe a province like Ontario you know it becomes a little bit difficult with the earlier models that we we've shown here Similarly, if you look at the, the Virtual High School uh, Global Consortium, which is now actually VHS Collaborate is the, the new term that they're using, um, you know, this is a cooperative model, which was one of the items that was on the original one that Tom Clark came, one of the categories in the original series that Tom Clark put out and if you looked at the revised version that came out in keeping pace that we saw on that table it would fall under the consortium model um, you know but this is one where you have multiple schools and each of these schools are paying a membership fee and putting so much into the system in terms of um, administrative support at their school plus um, a teacher that's going to teach a certain number of students and by teaching those students uh, you get an equal number of enrollments out of it so again, you know, these are supplemental situations, but the individual schools that are involved may also be involved in other programs. Some of the students in this may be doing it uh, supplemental. Others may be doing it full time if the school will allow for that. So again, doesn't quite fit nicely into the, our original models. Um, I described this one as an unintentional model. This is the Cyber Home Learning System, which is a program based out of South Korea. Um, it's an interesting one because th in Korea, um, or in South Korea, like many Asian nations, um, standardized testing is prevalent throughout the system. And standardized testing really determines what kind of primary school you end up in, what kind of secondary school you end up in, what kind of post-secondary program you end up in. So how a student performs on these tests is incredibly important. Because of that, what ends up happening is parents will spend as much as a third of their annual income on providing tutoring for their students to provide them with as much opportunity as possible. Now what the, the government in South Korea decided to do was they created this cyber home learning system which essentially was this online asynchronous um, content that could act as a tutoring program for any student that wanted it. Essentially trying to level the tutoring field so that uh, a student's determination in terms of the type of schools they attended and the educational opportunity they had wasn't determined by how much um, money mom and dad could afford to spend on private tutoring. Now because this system was already in place and because the students are using this system for tutoring purposes what ends up happening is teachers within the system start using this as a way of either blending their classrooms or as a way of extending their classrooms in more of a hybrid in some cases even an online environment. Um, so it becomes a really interesting model that's developed that really isn't described well by any of the, the models we've looked at up until now um, that really wasn't intended when the system was originally created. You know, so when you look at sort of what's happening here, what we're seeing is an evolution in terms of, of how we describe K-12 distance education. You know, this is a graphic that uh, Derek Wenmuth, who works with Core Education in New Zealand, developed in a book that CORE did looking at the impacts of uh, the e-learning and information communications technology programs that the Ministry of Education and the government in general in New Zealand had enacted over the past decade. To And what Derek tries to describe in this, he tries to describe sort of the evolution of, of, of e-learning or technology in the classroom uh, as a way of, of, of how we use the technology to deliver. And what he talks about here is, you know, when we were thinking about about K-12 distance education in a much more traditional way, um, it was very easy to describe. You know, when, if you look at, and Tom will probably talk about this in the second half of this week when he talks about the history and the evolution of, of K-12 distance education, um, you know, when you think back to some of the correspondence programs and the educational radio programs that we had, you know, it was, in all often, in, 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 
in many instances, what tended to happen was a school a student was either enrolled in a face-to-face -face school or the student was enrolled in a distance program and never stepped foot into a school. And in many instances, the distance programs were originally created because the student was too remote to actually physically travel to a school. So they, you know, you had so you had students in distance education and you had students or in a face-to-face -face education, but you didn't really have students doing both. As we start to look at, uh, you know, to, to move ahead in history, I guess is the best way of saying it, and you start to uh, see some of the audio graphics programs that, that got uh, implemented, and particularly once you start to see online learning come on the scene in, in the early 90s, um, within the K-12 environment, it typically happened where you had sort of a merging of that distance system and that face-to-face -face system. So when you looked at the early online programs, um, you know, these students tended to be in a school or at least in a school setting while they were engaged in their online learning. In many cases, even the full-time programs, at least those that, that weren't specifically focused upon homeschooling, the students still came to a learning center of sorts and were engaged in their online learning at that point. Um, but, you know, as, as an outsider walking into the room, it was very easy to tell if the student was learning from the teacher or learning from something on the computer. You know, it was still that, you know, while there was some blending in terms of, or some merging in terms of where the instruction was occurring, or at least where the student was located, you know, you could still see that it was two separate systems that just had this little overlap. Um, whereas as you start to see some of the, the models that are developing right now, um, it's, it's moved from that traditional to that connected to now what Derek describes as networked learning, where you could walk into a classroom and you've got a teacher in the room and um, students sitting in front of some kind of devices and they're using the content on those devices but the teacher in the room is also teaching them where as an outsider walking in it would be difficult to say okay this is an online class or this is a face-to-face -face class um, in all honesty the networked term tends to be a good descriptor for what in North America we've often called blended learning. Uh, and if you've listened to the first video, you, you've already heard some of the um, critiques or criticisms of, of that term. But essentially, it, it's a way of using the systems that we've developed for online learning, but using them in a face-to-face -face environment or using them directly with the student to create a, a much more individual or personal learning experience. Um, you know, so that's another sort of way of looking at it that in all honesty within that that um, geographic context anyway in the Australian New Zealand um, um, Eastern Asia uh, East Asia area is starting to, to really become more predominant in terms of how people are looking at the way K-12 online learning is changing and which sort of leads us to, and I, and I really like this this graphic, uh, John Watson again and his team at Evergreen. Uh, this was in the last couple of Keeping Pace reports. But what John has done here, instead of, of trying to um, come up with neat little categories that would fit into sort of a table like we've seen in the past, um, what he's done here is he's put... I don't know if you'd call them categories or factors along the left-hand side here, but these are essentially different areas. And in each of those, these areas or categories or, or factors, you will see that there's sort of a, a range of ways in which you can look at things. You know, so if you look at, say, operational control, there are sort of six kinds of variables that you might see uh, with the type when, when we're talking about operational control. And in the ones that have the straight up or downs, so operational, con the straight up or down lines, sorry, um, so operational control and type, those are ones where you should be able to fit people into a category. Um, you know, so you can say that the control is at the consortium level or at the university level, but it tr probably won't be both. Whereas the ones that you see kind of have the little arrows in there, so the reach, the location, the delivery, the type of instruction, the grade level, the teacher-student interaction, and the student-student student interaction, those are meant to be a range so that you could have, you know, ones where it would appear, you know, 
it's fully async. If you look at delivery, for example, it's fully asynchronous, or it's fully synchronous, or it might be along the range there. So 60% of the student's time might be asynchronous, and 40% might be synchronous. Or if you look at location, you know, 80% of the student's time might be spent in a school. 20% may be spent at home, or maybe they only have to spend one day a week in school, maybe one day a week in a, a workplace or some uh, organization that the, the, the program, the K-12 online learning program, has a partnership with, and then the other three days a week at home. You know, so they're, they're those with the sort of triangular things or the, the angle things, uh, the greater than or less than signs that you see there, um, those are ones that are kind of more of on a continuum. And this is, I think, is a really useful way because it gives us a way of, of describing things in a much more um, complete way. So this is the second and final presentation for the first topic, uh, which is classifying online learning. And this was uh, looking at different ways in which we can describe online learning. Again, you've got my contact information there. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact me. And I look forward to interacting with you on Twitter and your blogs and any other forms of communication that you plan on using for this virtual schooling MOOC 2012.